thanks to all of you for coming out at a very, very busy time of the year. I appreciate it. I've been a long time uh, friend of this uh, center uh, that Carol runs, and every two or three years I give a, uh, a lecture here. Let me just say a few words before I start. Uh, this uh, last book that I'm doing, which will be coming out in July, is a little unusual for me because it is more, I think, in the tradition of intellectual history. It contextualizes thinkers with whose work I have dealt on my life uh, a bit more strongly in, in the historical and existential circumstances of their lives. Uh, the book has chapters, of course, on Hannah Arendt, Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Judith Clark, Surprise, Albert Hirschman, which happens to be one of my favorite chapters of the book, and Isaiah, Isaiah Berlin. And as Carol said, this is the last, uh, from the last um, chapter uh, that I will be, I will be reading. Yet, as many of you know, Isaiah Berlin is not a thinker with whom I have dealt uh, much at all, and this is the first time that I have written extensively uh, um, about him. So uh, let's see how it goes, okay? Upon Sir Isaiah Berlin's death on November 5, 1997, Leon Wieseltier, the former literary editor, the now discredited editor of the New Republic, wrote an encomium titled with a Talmudic saying, the first quote, when a sage dies, all are his kin. Wieseltier wrote elegiacally, the pluralists are his kin and they must mourn. The rationalists are his kin and they must mourn. The democrats are his kin and they must mourn. The nationalists are his kin and they must mourn. The Jews were his kin and they must mourn." End of quote. Subsequent commentators on Berlin's work, even those most sympathetic to his best known thesis, such as the irredeemable plurality of human values, two kinds of liberty, the hedgehog and the fox as styles of political thought, have not been quite so sanguine or complementary. Whether Berlin can reconcile all his kin despite his Talmudic skills remains a vexing question. The relationship of liberalism to Berlin's value pluralism remains fraught, as does the question whether value pluralism can avoid relativism. Judith Clark was closer to the truth when she wrote in a review essay that conflict between loyalties is endemic and that, if anything, they would increase in the age of nation states. A seamless reconciliation of all these dimensions of one's identity was an illusion. In a review of Berlin's work, Schlar stated, I'm sorry, I didn't put down, if one cares, as Berlin so obviously does, about how one behaves as part of a group, about such values as loyalty and personal honor, then one must accept the fact that in our actual life, our moral choices are not unlimited, and we more often have to select nuances rather than bold aims. She admits, however, that this seems to have been implied, rather than said in Berlin's work. Contrary to what Schlar recommended, Isaiah Berlin's views on value pluralism led him to articulate bold aims rather than nuances, nor did he attain reconciliation among his conflicting commitments as Wieseltier presumed. Let me contextualize this conflicting views of Berlin's work and persona through the prism of Max Weber's doctrine of value pluralism. In the first half of my lecture, I will distinguish Weber's existentialist pluralism from Max Weber's liberal value pluralism, from Berlin's liberal value pluralism, I'm sorry, and both from the epistemic pluralism of John Rawls. Berlin, I will argue, is greatly indebted to Weber, and hence the line between existential and liberal value pluralism is quite tenuous. In the final part of my lecture, I will turn to John Rawls, who cites Berlin generously in his later work. Rawls's analysis of the burdens of judgment proposes some new perspectives on value pluralism and is indebted to Berlin. But this concept, in turn, creates some difficulties for Rawls's own attempt to distinguish reasonable from unreasonable pluralism. 
In this lecture, I offer no solution to these puzzles. Rather, my goal is to mark a trajectory from Weber to Berlin and to Rawls, which is rarely noted or analyzed. So let's begin with Max Weber on disenchantment and value uh, pluralism and come quote two on the handout. And I'm so honored that Stephen Lukes uh, is, is here. The influence on Isaiah Berlin's thought of Max Weber's diagnosis of modernity as a process of disenchantment and sovereign, characterized by warring gods and inevitable polytheism, has been discussed by Stephen Lukes as well as Peter Lassmann. In his conversation with Berlin, uh, printed in Salma Gundi, um, uh, Stephen Lukes asked, uh, and this quote number two, there are other writers than yourself whom I could think of, for example, Max Weber or Nietzsche or Carl Schmitt, who have observed this clash between values but have drawn conclusions that are rather different than yours. To which Berlin replies, at court three, let me tell you that I first have to admit to you something very shaming. When I first formulated this idea, which is a long time ago, I had never read a page of Weber. I had no idea that he said these things. People often ask me, but surely Weber is the first person to say this. I answer, I'm sure he is, but I had no idea of it. It's not, the third quote is now coming. Peter Lassmann remarks on this exchange with Lukes that, quote, one can excuse Berlin's lapse of memory here, but he seems on other occasions to have shown more awareness of Weber's work than he was prepared to admit. Lassmann recalls that in his 1969 introduction to his four essays on liberty, Berlin had remarked, and this is now quote number three, the classical and still it seems to me the best exposition of this state of mind, i.e. pluralism, is to be found in Max Weber's distinction between the ethics of conscience and the ethics of responsibility in politics as a vocation, end of quote. So obviously Berlin knew some of his Weber. But regardless how much of Weber's work Berlin was actually familiar with, Weber's theory of disenchantment and polytheism is important as a heuristic device by which to explore Berlin's own views. By disenchantment, as many of you know, Weber meant primarily the loss of magic first achieved through the rise of the modern mathematical sciences of nature in the 16th and 17th centuries. The loss of magic did not signify only a change in methods and theories for explaining nature and natural phenomena. It also signified for Weber the loss of the socially integrated power of worldviews based on religion, mythology, or cosmology, which had functioned as the legitimizing glue of pre-modern societies. And sobering for Weber was a process of both rationalization and differentiation. In fact, he often used the terms rationalization and loss of magic in the same breath. But what did Weber mean by characterizing modernity not only as a loss of magic, but also as a process of differentiation, as differentiering? And permit me to go into Weber in some detail here, because the contrast with Berlin is important. Differentiation for Weber refers to societal differentiation as well as to value differentiation. Modernity brings about differentiation processes at the societal level through the disembedding of the economy, to use Karl Polanyi's famous phrase, from the household and the polity. In other words, the market emerges as an independent and distinct sphere, supposedly from the state and the intimate sphere of the household. Furthermore, with the separation of the economy from the polity comes the rise of an independent administrative staff in charge of affairs of the state. The gradual monetization of relations of political authority and domination, that famous word in Max Weber, Herrschaft, changes the nature of political legitimacy. There ensues a shift from charismatic to impersonal and bureaucratic modes of rule, which Weber names legal rational uh, authority. 
Now, recall that for Weber, such developments only designate ideal types drawn with, brush, uh, with broad brush strokes, and not even Western European societies really conform to this model of societal differentiation that he proposed. Now, the path to value differentiation is different from, though not unrelated to societal differentiation, and this is the dimension that more directly influences Isaiah Berlin. The intellectual development of modernity not only brings about the rise of the mathematical sciences of nature, but with the prestige of this intellectual paradigm, other fields of inquiry, such as religion, ethics, aesthetics, jurisprudence, are obliged to develop alternative methods of inquiry and criteria of evaluation. Weber is an anti-positivist to the extent that he does not believe that the new science of nature alone supplies the valid method of rational inquiry. He follows Kant and the Neo-Kantian school of epistemology in arguing that every sphere of knowledge has certain presuppositions in accordance with which it is constituted. For example, in the natural sciences, we presuppose, this is the 18th century natural sciences, that using Kant's phrase, nature is the existence of things under laws. And our explanations have to form law-governed regularities. In the social sciences, by contrast, no matter how distant from us in time and space they may be, we have to presuppose that we can understand the meaningful course of action of human beings in other societies. As many of you, I'm sure, well know, Weber called this method Verstehen, translated as explanatory understanding, and contrasted it to deductive and inductive reasoning used in other disciplines. Now, these Kantian assumptions about the constitution of separate value spheres led Weber to argue that under conditions of modernity, this kind of differentiation would result in what he called a polytheism of values, or in the dramatic terms of his essay, Science's Evocation, modernity would give rise to the war of competing gods. And now we have point number four. Many old gods ascend from their graves. They are disenchanted and hence take the form of impersonal forces. They strive to gain power over our lives, and again, they resume their eternal struggle with one another." End of quote. It is appropriate to characterize Weber's form of value pluralism existentialist, I think, for the following reason. Not only do these values compete with one another, that is, as he puts it, something can be true without being good, and be good without being beautiful, and this is a reference to Nietzsche, but also because not only do these values compete, but we don't possess overarching and commensurate criteria for choosing among these competing values. For Weber, it's up to the individual to decide what her ultimate goals in life will be, and he states it very dramatically in one of his methodological essays. This is quote number five. The fruit of the tree of knowledge, which is distasteful to the complacent, but which is nonetheless inescapable, consists in the insight that every single important activity, and ultimately life as a whole, if it is not to be permitted to run on as an event in nature, but is instead to be consciously guided, is a series of ultimate decisions through which the soul, as in Plato, chooses its own fate i.e. the meaning of its activity and existence, and of course, sociologists don't write like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Weber's rather dramatic formulations and the existential darkness of his views have led many thinkers, from Leo Strauss onward, to accuse him of nihilism. We call a famous chapter on Max Weber in Natural Right and History. Yet this is not accurate. There is a non-negligible rationalist kernel uh, to Weber's vocation as a sociologist. He emphasizes that although social science cannot tell us which goals to choose, 
It can enlighten us about the consequences of our actions and policies once such a choice is made. For example, the social scientists cannot dictate whether we ought to pursue equality for all through full employment, or instead of for market competition, which will exacerbate inequalities. These values, goals, and policies are for politicians and citizens to determine, he says. What the social scientists can provide are generalizations to the effect that if you want to pursue full employment, you are likely to end up with a certain amount of inflation. If you want to pursue social solidarity, you may face capital flight and increased class resentment, etc. So the function of social science is to enlighten and inform us about the consequences of social action. And this behavior lies behind Weber's ideal type of the two ethical orientations, and this is my last paragraph on favor before turning to Isaiah Berlin, namely the ethics of conscience, the Zinungsethik, versus the ethics of responsibility for Antwortungsethik. And these are the two kinds of ethics that Berlin himself cites as the exemplary case of value pluralism. The one who pursues the ethics of conscience says, let the world be damned. I will pursue my principles and my goals Pari ad mundus fiat justitia, let justice be done, and the earth perish. The ethics of responsibility, however, tries to mediate between the costs and the consequences of the foreseeable results of one's action and one's principles and values. Although Weber admires those who stand firmly on principle, it is clear that in his view, only those who have a sense of balancing means and ends, i.e., in his view, the statesman and the charismatic politician who have a sense of the ethics of responsibility, those are the ones who should put their hands, quote, on the wheels of history. The rest are saints and adventurers, but they are not statesmen. Forgive the dramatic masculinism of Weber's, Weber's language. <laughs> well, not don't forget it, but note it, note it, right. So back to Berlin. Berlin shares Weber's tragic sense of choice among competing values, but he does not believe that this has been a problem in modernity alone, and this is a big difference. Berlin often refers to the thought of Machiavelli to show that even in the 15th and 16th century Florence, there were conflicting values. The values of Christianity, which advocated humility, honesty, and service, stood in contrast to the virtues of the ancient republics with their search for glory, civic courage, and placing the good of the city above that of one's own. Berlin also reminds us that most Greek tragedies are about the clash of incompatible values. Antigone is forbidden by Creon, the king of the city, from burying her brother Polynices because he has revolted against the city. Creo, by contrast, is there to defend the integrity of the city-state against those who have taken up arms against it, such as Polynices has done. For Berlin, such clash of values is a fundamental aspect of the human condition throughout human history. Forms of life differ across time and space, and even within our own societies, radically different forms of life coexist. Are strongly different values are advocated by different groups. Values clash. And as he puts it as dramatically as Weber, and this is uh, quote number six, these collusions of values are of the essence of what they are and what we are. If we are told that the contradictions will be solved in some perfect world in which all good things can be harmonized in principle, then we must answer to those who say this, that the meaning they attach to the names which for us denote conflicting values are not ours." End of quote. Not only can there be no harmony among values, there is also no hierarchy among them. Again, in words that do not fail to remind us of Weber, Berlin declaims, some among the great goods cannot live together. We are doomed to choose, and every choice may entail 
and insta irreparable loss and of course you know we are familiar with the issue of the anxiety of influence right so many of berlin's phrases are so much like vapors that you i keep thinking that there's a case of almost psychoanalytic repression here i mean you just read these sentences and you go what you know and but that's an aside now Whereas Weber's existentialism of values is well suited to the dark times in which he lived, Berlin's kind of value pluralism sits uncomfortably with his defense of post-war liberalism and appears to undermine his rational commitment to it. As is well documented, the origins of Berlin's thesis of value pluralism is in his critique of monistic views of human freedom and history that aim at the realization of a certain goal, goal, be it the classless society, the establishment of an aristocracy of talent, or in the words of the Gotha program, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Such visions of positive liberty will entitle Berlin argued public authority to coerce ordinary human beings to live up to the force of the ideal. What Berlin names his anti-monism is akin to the anti-totalitarianism of Cold War thinkers such as Karl Popper, Raymond Aron, and Friedrich Hayek. The postmodernist critique of the ideal of the totality and of Marxist meta-narratives such as in the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard is not unrelated to Berlin's perspective. But how exactly does one justify the value of individual liberty of choice or of liberalism on the basis of this kind of value pluralism? Couldn't a Schmidtian decisionist argue that the choice of the political as the most intense and supreme value is the right one? Such a commitment would necessarily be accompanied by the distinction between friend and foe. What would Berlin's answer be? From a Weberian perspective, there is no compelling answer against a Schmittian view of politics. And this is why Karl Schmitt himself considered himself a student of Weber and cited him approvingly in his essay on the concept of the political. Yet, Berlin is neither a relativist nor a nihilist, nor he claims maybe he's not a decisionist, but more importantly, Berlin does not accept also the positivist distinction between descriptive versus value judgments and the ascription of rationality only to the first. In a brief essay on the rationality of value judgments first published in 1964, and I'm going, he gives the example of a man who was in the habit of pushing pins into other people. I'm going back to this early essay because it's about rationality and I really don't think it gets us very far, but just uh, uh, listen to Berlin, uh, quote seven. He engages in an imaginary conversation with this man in the classical style of the analytical philosophy of his time and asks him whether, quote, he should do to others what he would try to prevent them from doing to him. <coughs> he says, the man says he does not understand. Pins driven into him cause him pain, and he wishes to prevent this. Pins driven by him into others do not cause him pain, but on the contrary, positive pleasure, and he therefore wishes to continue to do it." End of quote. Right? Classical, you know, analytic philosophy of that period. Upon being pressed by the imaginary interlocutor to explain whether it makes a difference to him, whether he presses pins into tennis balls or human persons, the man answers that he cannot respond to the interlocutor's strange concern. At this point, writes Berlin, I begin to suspect that he is in same way, in some way deranged. I do not say with Hume, here is a man with a very different scale of moral values from my own. I rather incline to the belief that the pin pusher who is puzzled by my question is to be classified with homicidal lunatics and should be confined in an asylum and not an ordinary prison, not in an ordinary prison, end of quote. 
There's a lot to be said about this, about this passage and its sort of very smug assumptions about what constitutes sanity, insanity, sadism, etc. And his whole discussion is painfully reminiscent of some of the psychological explanations put forward regarding the behavior of Nazi officers as well as doctors in concentration camps whose normality was likewise questioned and to whom sadism of various kinds had been attributed. And I should add that none of these explanations regarding normality or sadism, I think, ended up uh, illuminating the behavior of these individuals. Berlin simply concludes, quote, this seems to me to show that the recognition of some values, however general and however few, enters into the normal definition of what constitutes a sane human being. In this sense, then, the pursuit of or failure to pursue certain ends can be regarded as evidence of irrationality. End of quote. Now, what's happening here? Is this a fallback upon an essentialist conception of human nature or human rationality? How can Berlin be so smug, if I may use that word, about uh, these assumptions? But it is neither human nature nor human essence nor even the human condition that Berlin has recourse to, but the concept of the human horizon. In the pursuit of the ideal, he tries to elucidate again why his concept of pluralism is different from relativism. And this is quote number eight. I prefer coffee. You prefer champagne. We have different tastes. There is no more to be said. That is relativism. But what I should describe as pluralism is different. But Herder's view, and Biko's, is not that. That means relativism. It is what I should describe as pluralism. That is, the conception that there are many different ends that men may seek and still be fully rational, fully men, capable of understanding each other, and sympathizing and deriving the life from each other, as we derive it from reading Plato or the novels of medieval Japan, world's outlooks very remote from our own. Of course, if we did not have any values in common with these distant figures, each civilization would be enclosed in its own impenetrable bubble. And we could not understand them at all. So there is some kind of trans-historical continuity, some kind of trans-historical understanding and like Weber, Berlin emphasizes not only the likelihood, but the actuality of Fischke, emphatic understanding of other cultures. Now, Weber does not appeal to a common humanity in arguing that such understanding is possible. He only asserts that as social scientists, we must find all human action and conduct meaningful and interesting and seek to comprehend it. Just as sociological inquiry enlightens us about the limits of what can or cannot be done in the social world, so too for Berlin, inquiry into fundamental human values should educate us about our shared world. This is the enlightenment function of political theory, and it is why we study human values in the first place. Even if the study of political philosophy may provide neither deductive nor inductive proof of the proposition that inflicting extremes of suffering are to be avoided, this is a principal obligation of a decent society. Furthermore, such a society is one where we can engage in an experimental politics of balance, compromise, and trade-off. Berlin concludes Quote number nine, there is no escape. We must decide as we decide. Moral risk cannot be avoided. All we can ask for is that none of the relevant factors be ignored, that the purposes we seek to realize should be seen as elements in a total form of life, which can be enhanced or damaged by decisions, end of quote. For Berlin himself, such a moment of decision came while serving in Washington, D.C. as a British official. He got wind that the US and British government would issue a joint statement condemning Zionist agitation in Palestine. 
According to David Cott, a very important historical analysis called Isaiah and Isaac, about Isaiah Berlin and Isaac Deutscher, one of the best historical contextualizations of Berlin. According to David Cott, Berlin leaked the story to a Zionist publisher who informed in turn Henry Morgenthau, Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Having thus tipped off the Jewish lobby, Berlin managed to disguise his own role from the last British ambassador, Lord Halifax, end of quote. Thus, when the chips were down and the time came to act on behalf of one set of values rather than another, Berlin did not hesitate to choose. His loyalty to Israel and to the Jewish people, although he was not a religious Jew, trumped his royalty to the British crown. Nor was he a universalist or a binationalist like Hannah Arendt, the young Gershom Scholem, or Yuda Magnus. He tended, writes David Crott, to refer to the Arabs cursorily as the Arabs, not differentiating between the Palestinian population and the neighboring Arab states. His prism was that of a Western politics and personalities, and he did not publicly challenge the refusal of the US and the UK to welcome Jewish refugees and Holocaust survivors in the required numbers, even though privately he was willing to risk his reputation and career for the establishment of the State of Israel. There was a lot of consternation in the British diplomatic service at the time as to how, in fact, this uh, consular circular had gotten, had gotten out. So he took considerable, considerable risk. This was, he put his heads on the wheel of history in the sense of Max Weber. But philosophically, Berlin left much too much unclear. In what sense were values objective? Can those who live under certain values be deceived by them? What are the limits and constituents for Berlin of the human horizon? What and who belongs to the human horizon, and who or what does not, and why not? Can a decent society and uh, experimental liberalism of trade-offs be justified without appealing to more robust moral and political principles? I believe that despite his essayistic brilliance and great insights into the history of ideas, Berlin's writings leave the relationship of value pluralism to liberal democracies fundamentally unclear and tenuous. And let me add that I think in many ways is the facility and um, his stylistic brilliance as an essayist that has basically you know, pampered people from pushing and asking these philosophical questions. You know, he was trained as an analytic philosopher in the late 1960s. That's where the essay on rationality comes from. He got very disappointed with this, and he moved away from analytical philosophy and became what he called a historian of ideas. But the questions that he raised just, you know, continue, um, uh, continue to our own days. So now I'm going to turn to John Rawls, and I hope uh, uh, this may bring to you something of a surprise. But before I go to Rawls, let me just uh, observe that the dilemmas of liberalism haunted Judith Klar no less than Isaiah Berlin, Leo Strauss, no less than Hans Kelsen. Max Weber and Hannah Arendt viewed liberalism's crisis through a broader lens as being embedded in the institutional as well as value dilemmas generated by modernity. While Weber was troubled by the weakness of parliamentary institutions in post-World War I Germany, Arendt mourned the passing of the spirit of freedom that had flickered, even if briefly, in the revolutionary experiments of the Räte Republik of Munich and Berlin, the revolutionary councils of workers, soldiers, and students. For these emigres, I argue in the rest of the book now, a Weimar syndrome haunted their work. That is to say, how to defend modern constitutional republics intellectually and institutionally in an age of class conflict and value pluralism. Leo Strauss and Isaiah Berlin would opt for free market societies in post-World War II, whereas Arendt as well as Schlar proved more sympathetic 
to social democratic measures of ensuring social economic equality among citizens. The most courageous and comprehensive attempt in the second half of the 20th century to reformulate liberalism, such as to counter his own version of the Weimar syndrome, has been John Rawls's. His contribution provides a fitting conclusion to this discussion, I think, of the interactability of the challenges of value pluralism. By Rawls's own version of the Weimar syndrome, I mean his attempt to reformulate value pluralism as a problem of reasonable disagreement in constitutional liberal democracies. Now, quote number 10. In the priority of right and the ideas of the good, an essay from 1998, written nearly a quarter of a century after a theory of justice, Rawls observes that, quote, Sir Isaiah Berlin has long maintained and this is one of his fundamental themes, that there is no social world without laws. Sorry, the court is coming in a second. There is no social world that does not exclude some ways of life to realize in special ways certain fundamental values. And then he adds in the footnote that accompanies this passage, quote, very few times that Rawls evinces that he knows Weber. And he gets him right, I think. I believe that Weber's views rest on a form of value skepticism and voluntarism. Political tragedy arises from the conflict of subjective commitments and resolute wills. For Berlin, on the other hand, the realm of values may be fully objective. The point is rather that the full range of values is too extensive to fit into any one social world. And not only are they incompatible with one another, imposing conflicting requirements on institutions, but there exists no family of workable institutions with sufficient spaces for them all. That there is no social world without loss is rooted in the nature of values and the world. And much human tragedy reflects that. A just liberal society may have more space than other worlds, but it can never be without loss, end of quote. Now, I think you'll agree with me that this throws a rather unusual light on how to frame Rawls's own project of political liberalism. And my generation and me have criticized Rawls for his gender blindness, for his race blindness, many, many, many other respects. But I'm tracing a different dimension of Rawls's work uh, here. It is, uh, this quote is a moving acknowledgement of the tragedy of the political, with which we rarely identify roles. But it's a vision of the political deeply shared by Weber, Arendt, Strauss, Schmidt, as well as Berlin. For roles, reasonable pluralism, as opposed to pluralism of any kind, is what liberal constitutional democracies must accept as a baseline. And during this agreement about the good life and the different and incomparable values that we pursue to attain our visions of the good are an aspect of our human condition as late moderns. We must resist the temptation to avoid this condition by imposing one another a uniform understanding of the good life, whether in religion, ethics, aesthetics, or science. But it's not only disagreement, but also human cooperation which characterizes human existence. Whereas Weber and Berlin emphasize the inevitable conflict of values, Rawls is emphatic that no human society can endure over time that does not enable human cooperation. From a philosophical found point of view, the fundamental clash of values may be insoluble. But a defense of political liberalism cannot be based on a metaphysical doctrine about values alone. Rather, quote, it accepts that there exists no family of work workable institutions with sufficient space for all values. A just society is one in which citizens can view the terms of their cooperation as being chosen by themselves as free and equal persons capable of both rationality and reasonableness. Value pluralism alone 
cannot establish conditions for such a just and decent society. We need, according to all stronger premises about who we are as moral beings and as citizens of equality. In order to endure over time, social cooperation must be based on reciprocity of fair terms of cooperation through which persons can address one another as moral equals and citizens. Such cooperation rights rules is guided by publicly recognized rules and procedures that those cooperating accept and regard as properly regulating their conduct on the board. Public reason articulates constitutional essentials that must be an aspect of the basic institutional structure of liberal societies. In the nearly half a century that he articulated this project, Rawls, as you know, has subjected it to many revisions moving away from the conceits of a theory of justice which claim to formulate principles of justice subspecie eternitatis to a post-metaphysical view of political liberalism as providing a contextual articulation of the values and principles imminent in liberal constitutional democracies. Uh, these issues and transformations in Rawls's work are very well known and it's not my intention to re recapitulate them in this lecture. As Rawls's theory has become more contextual, however, the distinction between the reasonable and unreasonable forms of pluralism has become more contested. Many have questioned whether Rawls's own theory of reasonable pluralism does not amount to a colossal peticio principi, that is to say begging the question, in that it redefines pluralism itself to make it compatible with reasonableness, thus putting everything that does not agree with this version of reasonableness outside the realm of discussion. Many worldviews, ideologies, and doctrines deemed unreasonable are thereby left out of the purview of Rawls's framework. Um, again, there's a lot to say here, but let me, let me try to keep pursuing this line between Rawls and Berlin. Yet, it is important to note that reasonable pluralism for Rawls is not just a political, but an epistemic condition that is part and parcel of a, a scientifically enlightened great modern culture. Rawls goes farther than his critics acknowledge that in constitutional liberal democracies, quote, the burdens of judgment never cease, and citizens' task in providing each other with reciprocal reasons is interminable. It does not end with postulating constitutional assentments. Whereas Weber assumed that science could provide definitive answers which we are free to accept or not, Rawls's epistemology is much more tentative, and it is tempered by the fallibilism of the American pragmatist tradition from Willard Quine to Richard Rorty and beyond. In his remarkable discussion of the burdens of judgment, Rawls lists six sources of epistemic pluralism, and again, forgive me for citing at such length, but I find that uh, this is not a dimension of Rawls's work that's been paid uh, much attention to, and it has significant consequences uh, for his theory of justice and also for the problem of value pluralism. First, he says, and this is from political liberalism, um, the evidence. How can we judge as it bears on a case in law, in medicine, in science? Even when we agree about the evidence, we may assess its weight and import differently, as every lawyer knows, right? In courts of law and in medicine, once we establish something as evidence, we still have to reach a common judgment about the proper way to give to it. Three, all our concepts, he says, not only our moral and political ones, are general. They are subject to indeterminacy, and we must rely on judgment and interpretation about their applicability as well as their range. How we interpret our concepts, the way we assess evidence and weigh moral value and political values is shaped, quote, by the totality of our lived experiences. It's just like, you know, pretty, pretty remarkable, you know, concessions coming out here, right? 
Often there are different kinds of normative considerations on both sides of an issue, and reasonable people may disagree. Finally, we may each bring to bear very different normative considerations to the same body of evidence. And at this point, Rawls once more cites Berlin, quote, as Berlin reminds us, any system of institutions has limited social space, and only some values can be realized, and many hard choices seem to have no clear answer. End of quote. Some have pondered whether these epistemic conditions of disagreement, which Rawls calls burdens of judgment, are not so radical as to throw into question a lot of what Rawls has set out in political liberalism in general. As Peter Lassman writes, quote, the attempt to separate pluralism from reasonable disagreement is not compelling. If we point to Rawls's burden of reason argument, in order to identify the sources of disagreement, then it would appear that his clean separation of the two principles cannot be made as easily as he implies." End of quote. Now note that uh, Peter Lussmann, in this very good book, Pluralism, he makes a mistake or you know, he is careless in referring to burdens of reason rather than burdens of judgment. Rawls is talking about burdens of judgment, and this has consequences. I'm more sympathetic than Osman is to Rawls's attempt to distinguish burdens of judgment from principles of public reason. And in general, in my other work, I endorse a morally constructivist account of principles of cooperation and a just society along the lines of the late Habermas Reiner. <laughs> I'm not going to go into this. So uh, let me uh, try to come to a conclusion. Now, as we can see from this discussion, pluralism is not relativism. Each thinker considered in this lecture acknowledges the, the multiplicity and incommensurability of values, while also setting some limits on anything goes. Anything does not go. Everything is not defensible. For Weber, those limits are set by a rational scientific mindset, which ought to inform an ethics of responsibility. Though science itself can never answer the question about the value of the pursuit of science for the individual, what must I do with my life, Weber here quotes Tolstoy, there is little question in his mind that for the politician and the statesman to ignore the evidence of the sciences would be an act of irrationality and irresponsibility. Okay? In terms of our conflicts, global warming exists. For Max Weber, this is not an existential choice. It's irrational to ignore it. For Berlin, the boundaries of value pluralism are constituted by what he calls the human horizon without much elaboration, but which enables us to understand each other across time and space. At the same time, Berlin urges us to seek the reduction of human suffering and to strive for the creation of a decent society. Although he does not justify these values any further, he seems to take for granted that most, if not all, human beings will seek to live by them. For Rawls, constitutional democracies have to accept the reasonable pluralism of values and the inevitable burdens of judgment. Nevertheless, such reasonable pluralism can be practiced only as long as we recognize each other as free and equal citizens who are both rational and reasonable. Only thus can we defend democratic <laughs> toleration. The problem of judgment, which Rawls <coughs> turns to a racist late in his work, is not one that permits clear-cut <laughs> theoretical solutions. Kant distinguished between mm -hmm. deter determinative and reflective judgments. To remind you briefly, in determinative judgment, Kant assumed that the universal or the principle is given, and the particular is simply subsumed under it. In reflective judgment, the principle or the universal that needs to be applied to the particular must first be articulated. It is reflective judgment, the capacity for exercising what Kant also called enlarged mentality, in situations when the principles that should guide us are rather neither readily available or have been discredited that comes into focus here. 
Berlin appeals, appears to feel no particular metaphysical angst in view of this question. Yeah. I think there is a kind of common sense uh, comfort in a lot of Berlin's formulations, which probably comes from being basically a very comfortable migrant in the Anglo society that you know that you know he migrated to and he was very successful in that. Now Weber is completely preoccupied with this problem of judgment. Uh, for Weber who saw the collapse of Kaiser's Germany and experienced the emergence of a very uncertain future uh, judgment remains a particular burden upon the individual. Rawls's dilemma is different than either that of Weber or Berlin. Rawls does not believe that principles of moral and political thought are unavailable to guard judgment. Okay? I mean, his whole political philosophy argues to the best that he can for the rationality and reasonableness of these principles. But to my mind, he gives the most bad, vivid, and still unsurpassed, even though defective, defense of political liberalism. But the question that haunts Rawls is whether the burdens of judgment, which even these principles have to bear, can assume or lead to a common civic point of view. How far can the divergence in burdens of judgment go without their directed forces pushing us so far afield that a common civic conversation is no longer possible? At a time in our societies when democratic tolerance, the civic conversation, and the value of scientific reason all seem to be up for grabs, it may not be unimportant to revisit this discussion about value pluralism that took us from Max Weber to Isaiah Berlin and John Rawls. So thank you for listening. I know I raised more questions than I And so we can talk about trade-offs. So he came to the view that uh, you know the problems were less serious than you might think. And and indeed, when talking about Western societies, he, he, he didn't talk about the rest of the world. When we talk about Western societies, he thought we could speak about trade-offs rather than tragic conflict. He came to that view. So that maybe is an example of your of your um about comfortableness. There's a sense, I mean, it's interesting that Berlin never really talked about, wrote about, um, never wrote about Schmidt, didn't write about Weber ever, never wrote about the Holocaust. Uh, he, his mindset was really focused on anti-Totalitarianism anti and he was thinking about communism. But one thing I wanted to just raise Two things really. One is about the um, conflict with Weber, the difference with Weber. 
Weber was, as you say, an existentialist, but there's another big difference, it seems to me, which is that for Berlin, values, as you rightly said, were objective. So he thought they were objective, but multiple, and in conflict. And that's a difference with Weber, because Weber, and this is something we didn't say, but it seems to me there's a strong influence on Weber by Nietzsche. And so I think insofar as you could, you could say that Berlin was a sort of moral realist, Weber was not. Mm -hmm. uh, for Weber, I mean, you, you know, you talk about the conflict of the gods, but in that same passage, Weber talks about this in terms of um, incompatible attitudes. The, uh, the, the, atti the fundamental attitude towards life, says Weber, are in incompatible. When he talks, for example, about the conflict between uh, you know, accepting the Sermon on the Mount or uh, an ethic of military honor. That's to do with, that's not to do with objective value, that's to do with how we project our attitudes onto the world. And there it seems to me there's a difference between Weber and, and Berlin. Berlin, uh, this is something I think you said, Berlin never ever sorted out, you know, this question about pluralism and relativism. I, I think it was a mess. It remains a mess. Um, and, and I completely agree with you that, that Rawls gets much further and deeper. And it's much more interesting what, what Rawls has to say about the burdens of judgment. One other thing I'd like to say, and maybe I'll come back later if I may. Um, you say, uh, you, you at one point said that Berlin was uh, embraced free, free market capitalism. And you contrasted that with the social democracy of Korn. Yes. That isn't actually um, biographically true. He was a social democrat in his politics. He, he supported the Acting government. He was a big supporter of the New Deal. So, and he didn't like, he had a very strong antipathy to um, neoliberal, what we now call it, neoliberalism. He, he had no time for Hayek. So, uh, and he, he was, um, I think, to the end, was a supporter of what you might call social democratic what we call social democratic politics. So I think that part is sort of being correct. The rest of what you said I thought was great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. I, I thank you for that, uh, for that reminder. Maybe I was going a little too much you know, with a broad brush, brush stroke at that point, because um, you know, I didn't invoke the distinction between positive and negative liberty in this paper, which is what mainly has been written about and I think that maybe that leads one to think that he's closer to Hayek than in fact you know he may he may have been I'll concede that point thank you that's uh, that's um, uh, important now about the objectivity of values and Weber and Nietzsche and Berlin there again uh, we are in complete agreement uh, one of the um, early essays I wrote on Weber, which I set in, in the footnotes to this, uh, to this um, chapter, is that Weber is a nominalist in the extreme, mm -hmm. and he really believes that values emerge as a result of the attitude mm -hmm. that we have towards what he calls a meaningless space-time continuum. And I have argued that what Weber confuses is also very often the attitude of individuals with the social origins of meaning. Is I mean, as a sociologist, you know, he knows this. Uh, meaning is a, a socially encountered and socially generated. It isn't just the individual who gives or attributes meaning to nature by an act of uh, uh, choice. Right? I mean, mana is there. The gods are there. Not just because the individual chooses, but his extreme individualism and nominalism sometimes seem, makes it seem as if all social meaning and value emerges as a result of the subjective attribution. I think it's one of the big problems in favor of social theory and social you know, ontology, if you wish. Now, I... Is there really a defense uh, in Berlin's work, um, uh, which you probably know better than I, of the objectivity of that? 
does he ever give a philosophical defense of it, or is it just he assumes, you know, allergy more or whatever that values are objective? Yeah. There's no, if you mean is an adequate defense, I think the answer is no. <laughs> okay. The, 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 there's an attempt now and then. I think if I'm not mistaken, Tom Nagel somewhere tries to defend this. And he talks about fragmentation of value. Right, um, I mean. And so, uh, and Bernard Williams, too. I mean, I think there are people, not Bernard himself, who tried to defend this view. Um, but you can talk about values as objective, but also fragmented and conflict. But he never goes into it satisfactorily. No, he doesn't. And in fact, I, I am familiar with, you know, I mean, Bernard Williams, of, you know, as you know, he, they collaborated. Yeah. They wrote some articles together. And Bernard Williams is interesting and important in this uh, respect because he raises also the historical. Right. The historical question, are all values at all times? Uh, not only actual, but are they are they possible? Mm -hmm. And he uh, distinguishes between the relativism of you know distance, and that you know some some values for us or some friends are no longer are no longer on the table. Let's say you know the, the question of slavery and so on. So uh, you're you're right, and I should say that I myself am sympathetic. To the te thesis about the fragmentation of values, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't put my cards on the table in this lecture because I'm trying to reconstruct the thought of someone else. But um, I, um, you know, I know your early essay in this respect in that Habermas volume where you were pushing Habermas mm -hmm. around this question. I uh, would want to uh, agree with the fragmentation of values without necessarily mm -hmm. saying that no comparison. Is it all possible or no? But that's that's a really big discussion. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to jump in, which is not what I should be doing as chair. But a question to both of you, sort of mostly as a clarification. I mean, I think he's even more of a mess than you do, probably, Berlin, because I don't see how his conception of pluralism really goes with his understanding of freedom or liberty. Um, at, at one point, by the way, it just says, you know, liberty is one thing and justice is another, and that's it. That's just obvious, you know. But anyway, but he does want to give a priority to liberty mm -hmm. as a value. Um, so how is that compatible with pluralism, or how does he understand its compatibility with the pluralism of values? Is there a principled argument uh, 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 for it? Um, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, I don't think that I would be important to, because freedom was such a uh, major theme for him to kind of figure out. Well, the only defense that he could possibly give, okay, was that uh, uh, that. Acknowledging freedom would be compatible with acknowledging the value of tragic choice. Mm -hmm. And that if one did not acknowledge that, and if one were simply a monist, a value monist instead of a pluralist, one would not be able to acknowledge either the necessity or you know, the kind of the inherent tragedy you know, in, in choosing one rather than Right, but that would be like like the plurality of approaches to the good. So I would see how you could get that within a conception right. of freedom. But if freedom is itself a value, uh, I don't know. It's confusing to me. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. Stephen? No. He sometimes talks about freedom versus equality as an example of a conflict of values. He often does. And right. But but now, uh, clearly, freedom has a priority. In his, in his view. Well, that's, that's I mean, you know, um, the, the, the whole concept of, you know, negative versus positive liberties formulated around that, but that does get us back to the question of markets. It does get us back to the question of government, and I think it was Rawls who said, in some ways, this very contrast is itself bogus. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of freedom without equality? Is no, freedom I mean, something... I agree. Right? China. 
understand how freedom could have such a priority if there was really a pluralism of values. You know, I think it was in bad faith all over the place. That's my own thing about working with that. Worth, worth considering, however. So, more questions to Shayla. Yes. If I may. So, Shayla, thank you very much. That was great. I leave it probably to the uh, intellectual historians in 100 years why you at this time come up with this topic. <laughs> But one answer that comes to mind is, of course, that you might think that the Weimar syndrome, was that the term you coined, uh, which I think is great, uh, is so that we are perhaps near to a situation where that might come up again, and then you think about the thinkers. And if we take that pessimistic diagonal, diagonal uh, diagnosis, so, sorry, um, then the question is, what kind of answers do we have? And actually, even looking towards leaves it in a certain sense open, because he was also not a let's begründer. He did that and did, didn't think that there is an ultimate foundation that gives us a secure mm. foundation from which we can kind of derive the right moral principles. Um, and it has also to do so that we agree on certain basic fundamentals, we said free and equal, and that they can agree among each other. And actually, um, Jürgen Habermas, to bring him into the game here, has in that sense the same. So it's a basic fundamental ideas, but then it's left open to. Habermas is what? Has also been, he also starts with the idea, I guess I would say, with free and equal people and then uh, persons, and then actually he said to up to the actual dialogue under ideal conditions, I mean, at least in the form one, what comes out of it. So what I wanted to point out is in both cases, the, the last big liberal thinkers, uh, they have a kind of hope, you didn't use that term, but that's what I wanted to stress, have a hope that people will come to agreement and if the conditions are right and if they reflect on them in an appropriate way. But it's only hope. They can't kind of give us a secure foundation of this. And that is the question that I want to face, uh, want to bring to you, namely, what does that give us in a situation of a Weimar syndrome? I mean, that's, uh, do we have to hope? I mean, there would be a Kantian full solution to it. Um, what, what is your take on this? Uh, yeah, Stefan, you know, you know my, uh, <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why I took this U-turn in my uh, thinking, you know, the last book that I did was on human rights and I'm still working on asylum and refugee and cosmopolitanism because I'm not just an intellectual historian, I do constructive and reconstructive political philosophy. Um, uh, uh, part, of, uh, part of it is uh, maybe a little bit uh, a kind of, you know, personal, um, uh, uh, just, uh, I wanted to write about these thinkers without the, without the stress of pro proving a systematic point, okay? Mm -hmm. I wanted to contextualize their life and thought and play a little bit, open it up, but uh, uh, the Weimar syndrome is clearly, clearly uh, on, my, um, on my mind and the book ends uh, with, uh, with that and the next one should begin with it. I mean, look, uh, Rawls in some ways is the best we have of high democratic liberalism. That moment may be over, okay? I mean, if we talk among ourselves, I mean, there's, you know, the literature, the contemporary political theory is full of literature about, you know, post-democracy, uh, the death of democracy, the end of democracy. I mean, Rawls may be really the swan song of a moment. Uh, that uh, may be ending in our societies. And what's, you know, as we know, what's emerging is a form of um, authoritarianism and autocratic presidentialism. And it's not just in this country. Mm. It's a worldwide threat from Hungary to Turkey to Singapore to Poland, Latin America, again, just, just you name it, right? So there is that anxiety that I have at the end of this book, and I go, I go to these, uh, to these uh, thinkers maybe to, to uh, re, uh, re uh, think it 
uh, from a, a constructivist you know, point of view, I mean, philosophically constructivist point of view, there are a couple of issues that this whole discussion leaves me with. One is, as you know, uh, in the uh, communicative ethics, discourse ethics framework, and so on that I've defended, we have assumed some kind of a distinction between norm and value. And uh, I tend to agree uh, with uh, Rawls that you know norms are rules of action and interaction embedded, you know, in, in some cases embedded, in other cases informally present in societies. But norms must be able to sustain variety of values, even if they do not sustain or are compatible with all. So. Um, a, you know, that distinction somewhere there is a systematic distinction that I myself would be committed to. I'm not doing it in this, in this book, right? And um, uh, so that would be, I think, you know, the, the, the answer. The second would be, at what level are we committed at all to the concept of uh, a kind of reasonable uh, agreement? I'm, uh, I'm inclined to say that the question is not um, agreement, but the question is to have constitutional essentials such that the disagreement can continue in civil fashion. And that's what's not happening right now. That's where, you know, that's what's no longer, what, what seems to be politically uh, increasingly, increasingly um, absent. Right, and and uh, I'm you know I knew this question was going to to come up, and for a philosopher it should come up. I don't want to go on and on, but uh, the problem of class inequality is not very far from any of this. And I should just say, and I understand Rawls's political liberalism not to be economic liberalism, as many of you know. He said uh, my framework is to be true about the question of the market. And increasingly, you know, we know that Rawls basically is compatible with a far more redistributive yeah. and social egalitarian framework than we have ever, you know, than we, we have had. So in that sense, I think political liberalism is not at all incompatible with a commitment to a redistributive social agenda. And um, democracy is not compatible with the levels of inequality that we have right now in this country and also worldwide. So it's not just conditions of rational, rational communication, it's also conditions of the interrelationship of equality and freedom, right? Mm. Positive and negative liberty. Well, thank you for that, uh, for that question. I knew I deserved it. Let me invite some students to ask. Uh, do you have any questions? You're awfully quiet today. Mm -hmm. Just do you do you your hand hand Please go ahead. Anything? Think about it. I have an, it's a historical question, it's not philosophical at all, but um, why did Berlin not acknowledge knowing Weber? Like, was there any reason, did you like uncover any justification on why, like you said, I don't know the work of Weber, even though clearly he did? Oh gosh, I mean, again, you know, Stephen is more, oh, I mean, as I suggested, some, some formulations are so alike, like if you look at them on the, on the page, um, uh, look, sometimes it also really happens that you read someone, not as a scholar does. It invokes someone in you, but then, you know, you really may have been thinking the, 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 same, the same thing. It is not, it is not in, impossible. I mean, I kidded a little bit by saying anxiety of influence. But, uh, you know, what's funny, he takes from uh, Weber this distinction between an ethics of conscience and an ethics of responsibility, right? right? Um, that is very important, but it's not all of Weber. The more interesting parts of Weber are in the essay, uh, Sciences Evocation. Right. He quotes from politics as it. Stephen, did you raise this issue in the interview with him? I don't remember, because science as a vocation is the... I didn't go into the distinction between the two essays, no. But I mean, I think partly the answer to your question is he had an antipathy to sociology, actually, <laughs> uh, which was, had something to do with his you know, immersion in this world of 
analytic philosophy, uh, analytic philosophy. I uh, studied with, I didn't, he was never my teacher, but I was in that world. And I did my doctoral dissertation on Durkheim. And I remember when I went to see him about it, it was plain that he'd never read any Durkheim. Um, although he didn't, I mean, he, put, he, put, he, put, he purported to have read Durkheim, but he had And I, I don't believe he read much paper. And he was kind of not worried about that. I agree about the, the, the seeming <coughs> echoes of Weber, but I'm not sure, I, I doubt that he read that paper. He, may have read, he probably read that essay. Yeah, yeah, he probably, I mean, those essays, I mean, are so crucial, you know, yeah. that even if you didn't deal with you know, the theory of societal differentiation and so on. Mm -hmm. Look, there is another thinker that if, you know, this were not the last chapter and this were the book, Georg and Albert, there is one thinker uh, uh, who has to be brought in here and whom Berlin may not have known, but that's Hans Georg Geimer. Uh, I mean, who formulated the concept of the horizon, the horizon yeah. as the horizon of transhistorical understanding, that we always only understand the past from the standpoint of we are at the present and understanding the past is always a conversation between yeah. past and present. And you know, and it's just like uh, Geimer gives the best philosophical defense in truth and method to this model of fresh in and what Berlin himself was intuitively was going towards, right? Vico and Herder. Vico, Vico. Vico is crucial yeah. to all of them. You know, Vico the critique, you know, the critic of Cartesianism, you know, the event, the articulator of this uh, well, uh, so there is there is a lot more that can also be done uh, done uh, there. Question. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I gotta give it to Sumi and not Sumi. Thanks, yeah. thank you, Carol. Um, I. I'm curious, I would love a little bit more maybe context or elaboration of regarding um, the state of Israel and what it was at the time of Berlin's decision and also perhaps as a contemporary, like Israel's own unsustainability as a pluralist, as a pluralistic democracy would seem to be sort of an interesting case study both in you know not just in terms of Berlin's own identity and decision making, but also about this very these, these very these, these same tensions. I'm looking. I'm thinking specifically about that Rawls from the Rawls quote that there is no social world without loss, right? And that much human tragedy reflects that. It seems as though that seems like the very underpinning of the state of Israel's founding and its negotiations of its uh, its own sort of pluralistic democratic. Self. So I'm just wondering if there's, if you see yourself going in that direction or where you, how you might do it. Yeah. Um, not with Berlin, no. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot, there is a lot about Israel-Palestine in this new book because one of my chapters is um, a critical discussion of Judith Butler on parting ways. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I'm, I don't go with Berlin at all on this, though I think that at that point in time, Berlin did put his hand on the wheel of history, and uh, the refugees of Europe needed a place, and the UK decision not to admit uh, more Jewish immigration to Palestine was, in my opinion, wrong. I know there are a lot of Palestinian colleagues who would say to me, but in arguing that, you are supporting the Nakba. And what I have to say to that is, um, I hope not, but uh, uh, we cannot forget the British behavior at that time that led to many ships. Mm -hmm. I know this personally, even off the coast of Istanbul, you know, being leading to the drowning of mm -hmm. uh, civilians, etc. So that is a specific historical moment, but even in that specific historical moment, and this is why I respect Hannah Arendt so much, it was possible to ask to be against the British decision of interdiction, and yet at the same time to seek modes of coexistence. Mm -hmm. And there was a very strong binationalist movement at that time. right? And uh, Arendt and Scholem belonged to this uh, binationalist uh, movement. It, they came to part from each other much later around the Eichmann affair. 
But this binationalist movement uh, um, uh, uh, continued maybe for another 10 years maximum after the foundation of the State of Israel. And uh, then it just got swallowed completely by the Zionist project. Okay? So uh, uh, there were, uh, I mean, I think that Butler is absolutely right, you know, to talk about this other chapter in the book, in trying to create a space uh, beyond a Zionism that was also pre-Zionist, there's a space of coexistence, right? And um, uh, uh, I haven't read, um, uh, much by Berlin in all the things I've read. Uh, I know that he was, uh, was he awarded the Jerusalem Prize? Yeah. He, he traveled you know, to Israel often. He never expressed any, any uh, criticism. And I think he just remained in solidarity. And for him, the Palestinian question he was- He was very like critical of the occupation. He was critical of the occupation. But he said it was incompatible with, with the democracy. But, he was always very cool. Stephen, did he publish this? Uh, he was, what I was going on to say, he was a, he was a very timid politically mm -hmm. uh, in, in public statements. Mm -hmm. I used to get, try and get people to sign petitions in, in Oxford about this and that, and he would never sign. Mm -hmm. uh, once he did sign, and he said reluctantly. In other words, he, he was very timid uh, in, Public um, as a public, he was he was a timid public intellectual. Very <laughs> interesting. Given given given, given the other, yeah. uh, yeah. other question. Yes, Moshe, thank you so much. This was illuminating. I mean, I apologize because I come from a different field, but it occurred to me like two things occurred to me while you were talking. The first one is no Kelsen. You mentioned Kelsen ah. very quickly, but somehow you know we're reading recently this essay on the preconditions of democracy. There's a very clear understanding of what he calls relativism, which is not really relativistic, but you know on, on, on the ground that this is a responsibility that you would not want to take away from a, from societal dynamics. Um, the second thing that occurred to me when you were mentioning the burden of judgment is that as a, I am a constitutional law scholar, that in effect, this is exactly what judges do. We, in Europe, we call it proportionality. You weigh one right or one value against the other, but of course there is nothing neutral about this weighing because you know, how do you attribute? But what judges really do, I think they have interiorized their roles, understanding of overlapping consensus, because what they do is they use seemingly universal values like dignity, etc., which of course are semantically unstable, but they present them as universal in order to take decisions that you know don't, do not alienate segments of the you know let's say of the, of the policy. But in effect, they do take decisions that have, you know that are value loaded. I don't know if that makes sense. To you. Of course, it makes sense. And as you know, you know we've been. Um, I think I think that you you see. Um, uh, you, you see here, or rolls this paradigm of the burdens of uh, uh, judgment. I mean, he doesn't say explicitly that you know he was inspired by constitutional court judging. In fact, it's amazing. I don't know until later work that well, but that there is so little about legal hermeneutic in his work. There is quite a lot about constitutional essentials but not that much about the question of judging, and surely he knew also Dworkin's work. Right. Shiva, you probably know the later work of Rawls. Uh, is there any kind of... Uh, no, not much. Not much. No, not much. No, not much. Not much. I think Michael also talked about yeah. this with him, and so mm -hmm. we had colleagues mm -hmm. at Harvard to whom yeah. we yeah. talked. Uh, but yeah. I, I don't think they quoted that. Right. And uh, as far as uh, Kelsen is concerned, of course, uh, uh, he uh, goes in and out of the argument of this um, uh, of this uh, uh, book. But uh, one of the difficulties, of course, is the extent to which uh, the Kelsen-Schmidt debate is over, <laughs> whether it's uh, in some ways continues or, or or how. But the preconditions of democracy, I mean, would become more and more painfully. You know, aware of uh, of what those uh, those preconditions are. So if we could take one or two more questions, and then we should mm -hmm. move down to uh, informal discussion of the wine and make it uh, short. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe this is kind of a peripheral question, but I, I just didn't understand that. Um, what, why, why is, uh, could you explain why Weber would be a, 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 um, um, an existentialist? Uh, I think of existentialism as uh, the Kierkegaard kind of movie. Why, why would Weber have to say that? Um, because he basically uh, thinks that it is the individual's mm. subjective choice, stance, and evaluation oh. that gives that gives uh, meaning. And I think that um, there are also some passages when even the Berlin sounds very much like yeah. he's quoting, he's quoting, you know, Kierkegaard, right? right. That the, the choice between the night of Faith, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious, and how do you how do you choose how do you choose between them? In 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 that sense, I think, and the so the so uh, root of all this and statement is Nietzsche, and mm -hmm. I mean this is not, yeah. you know, I just uh, and even the quote something can be beautiful despite the fact that it mm -hmm. is ugly, and something can be good despite the fact that it, that, that is you know I quote you know also from Nietzsche. So in that sense, I think labor can be can be called an existentialist, but he's also, as a social scientist, there's also this rationalist dimension mm -hmm. uh, 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 to him. Yeah. Can you ask a question? Sure. Yes, on the on uh, the quote seven, it's really troubling to me. The the, the, the quote about the the pin pricker, and uh, he, 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 he's he's very radical about sending the the pin pricker. To the asylum is the range. I mean, but the situations that we are faced with actually are not as clear that there's actual being freaking. So to me, I think that's a that's a prelude to totalitarianism. I don't know if, if he felt or anybody else sees sees that because who's the arbiter of what's the the being freaking that's actually non-human, not result of human behavior, and what if the arbiter, the judge, looks in the mirror and actually he's the I don't know. Is there any? Mm -hmm. what, 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 what no, that's, a, that? that's, a, that's a very, very interesting point that you are raising. I was um, really quite disappointed by this essay, mm -hmm. and I kept going back to it, trying to see. Okay, it's good that he's an anti-positivist, and it's not just scientific or logical judgments that are rational. Value judgments can also be rational. But at the end of the day, when you ask the question of why you end up you know, falling either back on a kind of moral realism or on a kind of uh, a common sense which may not be that innocent, as you say, you know, who, who judges? You know, this very cavalier attitude about who is a homicidal lunatic, right? I mean, it's, it's not such, a, such an easy, easy judgment to, uh, to render. So, I share I share your sense that uh, that quote you know may be more the source of trouble than anything than anything else. Um, mm -hmm. Well, please join me in thanking Sheriff. Uh,